On the 7th of August 1942, 14,000 men of the US 1st Marine Division landed on the islands of Tulagi, Yavutu Tanambogo and Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. Under the command of Major General Alexander Vandergrift, the Marines secured their main objective, an unfinished Japanese airfield on the otherwise insignificant island of Guadalcanal. This was only the beginning of what would become one of the most famous campaigns of the Second World War. For six months and two days, the 1st Marines, nicknamed the Old Breed, fought over every inch of ground on Guadalcanal before emerging victorious in February of the following year. Yet, the Old Breed was not always destined for greatness, and its path to Guadalcanal proved to be a long and winding road. This is the story of the 1st Marine Division's journey to Guadalcanal. Although the 1st Marine Division was officially activated on the 1st of February 1941, it was actually the latest unit in a line of previously existing US Marine units. Activated in 1913, the 1st Advanced Base Brigade was the true forebearer of the 1st Marines. A year later, the brigade was renamed the 1st Brigade and would eventually serve in Mexico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic and Cuba before 1935. On the 16th of September of that year, the unit was redesignated as the 1st Marine Brigade and relocated to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. By the time the 1st Marine Division was activated in 1941, many of the men already in the outfit were veterans of multiple campaigns and expeditions. Thus, the unit earned the nickname the Old Breed, which sticks to this day. When the US joined the Second World War following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the 1st Marine Division comprised only 8,900 men, which was far below its authorised strength of almost 20,000. However, a flood of fresh volunteers quickly filled its ranks when it became obvious that the Marines would play a major role in the course of the Pacific War. The recruitment age was also lowered from 18 to 17, while the Marine Corps mostly turned a blind eye to underage volunteers who were eager to serve. Where recruits went to train depended on their location within the US. Those who lived east of the Mississippi were sent to Paris Island, South Carolina, while those to the west trained in San Diego, California. African Americans were sent to the facility at Montford Point, North Carolina, due to the Marine Corps' segregationist policies at the time. Initially, basic training was cut in half from eight to just four weeks in order to get the division into action as soon as possible but this was quickly raised to seven weeks to produce better, more effective marines. Recruits were expected to follow a strict training regimen to prepare them for the trials of combat. Robert Lecky volunteered for the marines in January 1942 and was sent to Paris Island as part of the old breed. He later wrote that the most important virtue in his training was discipline. Apart from us recruits, no one in Paris Island seemed to care for anything but discipline, there was absolutely no talk of the war, we heard no fiery lectures about killing Japs. Marine recruits spent a minimum of 144 hours on weapons, 117 hours of physical exercise or garrison duty, and 54 hours training in the field. For those who did not wash out, the change they experienced was startling. Lecky wrote, In five weeks they had made us over. Most important in this transformation was not the hardening of my flesh or the sharpening of my eyes, but the new attitude of mind. I was a Marine. In March of 1942, the 3rd Marine Brigade became the first unit of the 1st Marines deployed to the Pacific, landing in British Samoa. The rest of the division sailed from Norfolk Naval Base and arrived in New Zealand in June 1942. Although the United States was committed to the Germany First strategy, the Marines would be needed to storm the hundreds of small islands and atolls spread across the Pacific theatre. By the beginning of July, the roughly 16,000 men of the division had assembled in Wellington, New Zealand, and earmarked for Operation Watchtower, the invasion of Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. The 1st Marine Division would face combat for the first time in early August of 1942. However, a full month of difficulties lay ahead. First, changes in orders and the lack of cargo ships meant that all of the division's two and a half ton trucks, 155 mm howitzers, and the sound and flash ranging equipment needed for counter-battery fire would have to be left behind in Wellington. 
The division leadership had originally intended to train for six more months in New Zealand, but Allied planners decided the Japanese airfield under construction on Guadalcanal needed to be captured as soon as possible. To make matters worse, the Wellington dock workers were on strike at the worst possible time. Private First Class Kerry Lane arrived in Wellington and received a briefing from his sergeant, who told the men, You Marines are going to unload these ships and then reload them for combat. That's going to be a lot of work. We haven't much time. We'll be working in around-the-clock shifts to complete this task in nine days. Because of the unforeseen delays, the expected D-Day of the 1st of August was pushed back to the 7th, while the Marines toiled loading their own assault ships. After 11 days of non-stop work, the division was finally ready to embark for the Solomons. On the 22nd of July, the Marines set off in a convoy of 89 ships with only the bare minimum of what was needed to fight and survive. Tents, spare clothing, bedrolls, office equipment, unit muster rolls, pay clerks, insect repellent and mosquito netting were among the many items which did not make the cut. The convoy first headed to the Fiji Islands to conduct a pre-invasion dress rehearsal from the 28th to the 30th of July. However, the manoeuvres were a complete mess as the division showed its inexperience. The simulated landings were chaotic and many assault groups took hours to make it to shore. General Vandergrift called the drills a disaster, while Private Lane would later write, Thank God the Fijis weren't in Japanese hands. If that had been the case, we would have been slaughtered. Nonetheless, there was no time for more training, with the invasion only days away. The task force set out for the Solomon Islands again, while the Marines learned of their mission on the way. The reaction of many was predictable, as most men remembered thinking, where the hell is Guadalcanal? Despite their initial incredulity, the officers of the old breed quickly impressed upon them the significance of their task. Lieutenant Colonel William Maxwell briefed his platoon officers days before the attack, telling them, it's of worldwide importance. You'd be surprised to know how many people all over the world are following this. You cannot fail them. The rest of the voyage was uneventful as Marines spent much of their time contemplating what lay ahead. They tried to pass the time by singing, playing poker, or cleaning and recleaning their rifles. Many grew nervous and edgy the closer they drew to their first taste of combat. At 4am on the 7th of August, the loudspeaker woke the marines from a restless night's sleep with a message that breakfast would be served in 30 minutes. Now hear this, you are going to have steak and eggs for breakfast, good luck marines. Despite the spectre of battle hanging over them, Robert Leckie remembered that We were apprehensive, not frightened. General quarters sounded at 5.30am as most of the men retreated to their troop compartments to gear up and conduct final checks on their equipment. By 6.30am, the task force was in position and the preliminary barrage commenced while aircraft flew overhead to pound suspected enemy positions. The short, sharp bombardment lasted only until 7.40am when the loudspeaker crackled again with a new order, land the landing force. With that, the marines of the 1st Marine Division climbed down their nets to their landing craft and set off for the beaches. By 9.30am, all of the landing forces in the first waves were ashore. The marines faced negligible resistance on Guadalcanal itself, but the islands of Tulagi and Gavutu Tanambogo proved harder to capture. Despite local difficulties, the marines had secured their most important objectives by the end of the first day. For most of the men, it was one of the most anticlimactic days of their life. Leckie recalled, We saw none of the enemy, that day was a dull, lost witness to the cycle of the sun, of which I have neither memory nor regret. This was soon to change, as the Japanese would commit themselves to one of the bloodiest battles of the Pacific Theatre. Guadalcanal would prove to be a hard-fought slog, and the first of many victories for the 1st Marine Division. The old breed had risen from relatively humble beginnings, and was now in the war it would go on to become one of the most respected U.S. combat units.